people. Pastor, we want you to know that we love you, that you're always in our prayers, and we thank God for how he is causing your recovery to be quick and strong and whole. And we look forward to seeing you. We thank God for prophets, for all the elders, the pastors. We thank you all for every member of Jesus' people. And we thank you for those who are tuned in who are not members of the body. We pray that on this evening that you will find something that we believe will be a well investment of your time. So our, our topic for this evening is journeying into eternity. Journeying into eternity, and the subtopic is to eternity and beyond. To eternity and beyond. And I, we're going to use as a scripture the book of Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. We'll read it in the New King James Version, and we'll also read it in the message translation of the Bible. So, Second Corinthians chapter 5 verses 1 through 10, it says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, and not because we want to be unclothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee. And so, and then it says, we're always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done whether good or bad and then the same scripture in the message says for instance we know that these bodies of, uh, bodies of ours are taken down like tents and folded away they will be replaced by our resurrection bodies in heaven God made not handmade and we'll never have to relocate our tents again. Sometimes we can hardly wait to move. And so we cry out in frustration. Compared to what's coming, living conditions around here seem like a stopover in an unfinished shack. And we're tired of it. We've been given a glimpse of the real thing, our true home, our resurrection bodies. The Spirit of God whets our appetite by giving us a taste of what's ahead. He puts a little of heaven in our hearts so that we will never settle for less. That's why we live with such good cheer. You won't see us dropping our heads or dragging our feet. Cramped conditions here don't get us down. They only remind us of the spacious living conditions ahead. It's what we trust in but don't yet see that keeps us going. Do you suppose a few ruts in the road or rocks in the path are going to stop us? When the time comes, we'll be plenty ready to exchange exile for homecoming. But neither exile nor homecoming is the main thing. Cheerfully pleasing God is the main thing, and that's what we aim to do, regardless of our conditions. Sooner or later, we'll all have to face God Regardless of our conditions, we will appear before Christ and take what's coming to us as a result of our actions, either good or bad. Second, Second Corinthians 5, 1 through 10 in the message. So on this evening, we will discuss the journey and the destination. And we're talking again about journeying into eternity. So now there are certain topics, and I, I've been in the church all of my life, 
In fact, before I was born, my mom was pregnant with me in the church. So I've been in the church all of my life. And there are certain topics that many in the church consider taboo, off limits, to be discussed in secret. Maybe around the family dinner, but definitely not in public. Topics like sex, money, power, and eternity. Understand, now the church folk talk about these things, but they just don't talk about them in public. Not many of them anyway. So we have questions about them. According to Bishop Jakes, most people want more of three of these things. Now, I won't be bold enough to choose which three for you that you want more of. But people want them. We just don't discuss them. But one topic that I believe more than others seem to get excluded from this list, we don't, we don't want to talk about it. We don't even want to think about it. It makes us uncomfortable when we start talking about eternity because eternity for many of us is an unknown. So if you want to find out if, if people where they are, start talking to them about eternity and, and we will quickly find out who's on the Lord's side. Okay, everybody else, they'll be talking about, look, look, can we change the topic? I don't want to talk about that. Although the dictionary defines trip as a journey, I see that there's a, I believe that there's a difference between a trip and a journey. When I think of a trip, I think of going to a destination with the intention of only being there for a short time, being there temporarily. If you grew up in a country like I did, so we would take a trip to town, to the big city. If you grew up in town or in the city, you would take a trip to the country. Now, we were not going there to stay. We were going there to get something that we wanted, something that we needed, maybe to visit someone. But then once we accomplished what we went there to do, we would come back home. We would take a trip to the in-laws, maybe for the holidays or vacation. Although the relationship may have been great, we would pack our clothes, we would pack up our supplies, we would travel to the destination, we would spend there for an agreed upon time, we come back home. We would take a trip to Hawaii or to another country for the holidays, we would, we would go there and we would enjoy the time that we were there, but we would return home. Those trips included traveling to a destination and then returning back to the place where we were before. Now, a journey, based on how I see it, is different in that I see it more of a one-way travel, a one-way destination. I think it speaks to moving progressively in one direction. Now, why, why is that important? Why do I spend time sharing that? Because I believe that on the journey to eternity, when we get there, we don't want to come back. The stuff that we're dealing with, the challenges in this life, the challenges in our circumstances, we don't want to experience those. So if we get to eternity, I believe we're going to want to stay in eternity. And that's what I think is a journey. So, now, let me, let me offer you a thought just for you to think about. I'm not saying that this is absolutely fact, but I believe that there's some merit to it. So I'll give you a thought for consideration. We're talking about eternity. We are now, we have been since birth, and we will forever be in eternity. At creation, when God created man, God said he made us in his image. God is eternal. God always has been, God always is, and God will always be. We became a breathing, speaking spirit. Christ, Christ existed before there was a beginning, according to what's recorded in the scripture in the Gospel of John. The Bible says, in the beginning was the word. So the beginning began, started a time, and Christ was there in the beginning. When Mary was overcome by Holy Spirit and impregnated with Christ, Christ was for a short time introduced to this concept called time. Just prior to his death, Christ prayed to the Father that he would be returned to his previous status, the glory that he had once before. At his resurrection, he left time, he returned to eternity. That's why in Revelation it says, in Revelation chapter 1, Verse 7 and 8, Behold, he is coming with clouds, 
and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So, so at the time of our conception, we were introduced to this time-space continuum. Think about it. Before conception, how many moms walk around before conception? How many moms walk around talking about, well, I'm going to have a baby in X number of weeks, or I'm X number of weeks or X number of months pregnant? They don't talk about us in time until there is a conception. So at conception, our existence is introduced to this time-space continuum. At the time of our birth, our spirit now is contained in a temporal, a temporary, a mortal holding structure called a body. Now the Bible calls it a tent that we use to allow us a worldly consciousness. Without a body, a spirit is illegal in this space. So we're introduced to a body that we use to keep us with worldly consciousness, but inside of us there is this existence that operates outside of and beyond us. You, you, you hear people talk about they, they were outside of themselves. And I'm not talking about people who, who are having mental issues. I'm talking about people who are longing for something that's outside of them. It is through this awareness that we question the reality of what we see, what we hear, what we feel, what we experience. In fact, it's because of our eternal perspective that we often find ourselves frustrated with our current situation. We look and we say, there has to be something more to what I'm experiencing. And so it frustrates us. Something inside of us longs to connect with something outside of us. I read earlier in the book of Hebrews, and it says, sometimes we can hardly wait to move. And so we cry out in frustration. We are limited based on this physical housing and how we live because there are external laws that are helping to control what we can and cannot do. But in eternity, we are now operating outside of these earthly laws. All right. So now those who learn to sensitize themselves to the eternal perspective find themselves thinking like Apostle Paul when he said, and I'm paraphrasing, to be absent from the body is be present with the Lord. You ever talk to somebody who has been around the, and, and they have established a strong, solid relationship with Christ, and you hear them talk about death, and they say, I'm not afraid to die. Because they understand that death is, has held us hostage. Christ said, uh, Paul said, the last enemy to be destroyed was death. Death is an enemy. Death has held us bound, held us hostage in this temporal housing. That's not where we're supposed to be. So Paul says, man, and again, I'm paraphrasing. He says, I, I'm struggling with this. Part of me wants to leave this old building and clothe myself with immortality. He said, part of me wants to depart, which will satisfy this emptiness on the inside of me. He says, I would really enjoy that. But another part of me understands that if I remain here in this confined, restrictive, limited state, in this corrupted body, in this housing, that would be of a benefit for you. So I want to go, but it's needful that I stay. Truth, think about this. If you are still here, and if you listen to this, obviously you are, there's a reason that you're still here. I'm, I believe, and I, I'll say about John, I won't talk about you all, but I believe there's some people who are much better than John who've already departed. So we say that God looks down and he finds the good flowers. If God has allowed us to stay here, there's something, there's a purpose that we are to fulfill. Because when we have fulfilled our purpose, then I think we get to move on. Paul said, I've, I've, I've finished my course. I've done. I've, I've finished everything that was signed. Christ said, it's finished. So when that time comes, then God brings us home. God introduces us 
into eternity. We are eternal beings that have been, through the marvelous and wonderful work, the plan of God, we've been allowed to occupy time and space while we prepare for eternity. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 11, verse 4, the scripture says, He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity in our hearts. He has made all things beautiful, but inside of us, there is eternity yearning to be experienced. Imagine, if you will, <laughs> your time on earth as time spent in a hotel. For some, it may seem like you're in a low budget, $19 a night, hole in the wall, no amenities. And, 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 but it met a need. It met a need because nothing, and, and, and I mean absolutely nothing, else would have worked for you. There was nothing else available. So it met a need. For others, however, our time may have been spent like we're in a five-star resort that is better than we could have ever imagined. And not only were you in a five-star resort, but for some of you, some of us, we felt like we've been upgraded to the presidential suite. It's good for us. Regardless, though, of which place you ended up occupying, it's still a temporary place that only serves as a layo. You're not going to be in that $19 night hotel all your life if you have a relationship with God. If you don't have a relationship with God, that five-star resort, there's going to be a checkout time. Okay, It's only a temporary layover. It's not your home. It's not your final destination. Although you're able to do just about everything that you could do while you were at home, you know that there's something missing. So, Let's talk about the journey. One of the things that we need to do when we're going, getting ready to go on a journey is we need to plan for the journey. Most of us plan things. Sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes it's detailed. Where we look at all the factors. We look at all the conditions. We look at the outcomes. We look at our resources. Other times our plan is just a product of, of a survey of what's going on and then we make a quick decision and we act. Okay. We, we plan parties, we plan vacations, we plan weddings and celebrations, we plan for retirement, some of us. Some of us even plan for death and burial. There are only a few of us, however, who plan for eternity. Okay, the plan. Preparation for a journey consists of an evaluate, evaluation of many things. If you get ready to go on a journey, there are certain things that you have to take into account. One, you have to think about where you are right now, your current status, your current location. Some people are so comfortable in their current situation, they have no motivation to change. You ever heard somebody say, hey, look, why don't you come over? We're going to go and have fun. Come and do this. They say, nah, I'm good. <laughs> I don't want to go. <laughs> look, you say, no, I, I, I know what it's like here. I, I'll stay right here. Some people are good. They're comfortable in their current status, in their current situation. Our desire... Our, our desired status or our de desired destination. Not only do we have to look at where we are, but we have to look at where we want to go. Some people refuse to believe in the afterlife. They believe that once they're dead, that's it. They have no motivation to prepare for life beyond right now. We have to consider the path that we should follow to arrive. Some people believe that they are capable of managing their own life. So they have no motivation to include God in their planning. We have to consider the time and the distance of the travel. Some people believe that they have a long time to get ready. I'll do it tomorrow. The wine and sunk a song back in the 80s and 90s. Tomorrow. Who promised you tomorrow? You better choose the Lord today. For tomorrow may never come. But some people believe, man, I have time. I'm young. Man, I've got, they've been saying God is coming back since before I came and he ain't came back yet. Well, I'm going to take my chances. Okay? We need to also consider what do we need to carry on the journey and what do we need to leave behind. You can't take your whole house and pack it on a one-way journey. 
That would, that would make sense. So some people have and allowing stowaways. They're trying to take stowaways or freeloaders with them on that journey. What was a freeloader? A freeloader is somebody who is occupying your mind, occupying your senses, occupying your emotions, occupying your feelings. And you're trying to carry them with you on your journey. They t we're told in the scriptures, lay aside every weight. They can't go with you on that journey. They're carrying unnecessary weight, like bitterness and unforgiveness. Okay, On your journey, is it worth carrying? Okay, We have to consider who will go with, with us, who will be left behind. Everybody is not willing to do what you're doing on your preparation to journey into eternity. How will we travel? How much will it cost? Christ told us you ought to count the cost. Count it before you get into it. Because there is a cost required. There's a sacrifice. We told you on, on Sunday, man, that Christ said you got to deny yourself. All this stuff that you think is fun, you think is good, you think is enjoyable. If it's going to keep you out of, if it's going to keep you out of heaven, Christ says, man, cut off your eyes. I mean, pluck out your eye. Cut off your hand. Cut off your foot. It's not worth exchanging for eternity. Each journey is individual. Although others may accompany us for the travel, the journey only allows one ticket per traveler. Now, there are multiple factors that contribute to the comfortability of the journey. One, what is the pace? When two people are traveling together, one person is going to adopt the pace of the other person. Okay, So we can get on pace with God or we can try to force God to get on pace with us. I'm telling you, <laughs> I've seen this for a little while. A little while. I don't, I don't, I haven't seen situations where God has gotten on the pace of a man, or gotten on the pace of humanity, of a woman, okay? The pace that we're going, the weariness or the exhaustion. We need to plan for rest. We need to plan for recuperation. We need to plan for recovery. It's not easy. There's a struggle. Even Christ, even Christ realized that his disciples had been going for a while, and they needed to stop and rest, I'm telling you, you talk about this not not every day Sunday, every day in a in a good the sweet bye bye. That's not the walk of the that's not the walk of a person who is planning to go into eternity and spend it with Christ. There are going to be persecution. There's going to be people who will try to get aside of us. There are going to be some inconveniences. There are going to be detours. There are going to be roadway construction. You're not going to be able to have us travel a straight path. There are going to be some turns. Some twists and turns. There can be some hills and valleys on this journey. You have to worry about your unexpected expenses or costs. We talked about that a little bit. But it's going to cost you something. And you may not be willing or have been aware of what is required. But now you have to decide, am I willing to continue to invest so that I can get into eternity with heaven, uh, in heaven? Your faith, your belief, your endurance, your determination, that will to continue, even when it gets most difficult, even when it doesn't seem like anybody else understands, are you willing to continue to persevere on the journey to eternity? Okay? There may, there'll be many variations of our journey, many levels, many differences. There's going to be resistance. And most likely, two people are not going to experience the same journey. The duration is going to vary. Some people are here for a short time. Some people are here for, for over a century. The method will vary. The preparation will vary. The traveling companions will vary. The people who are with you at one point in your life may not be with you at another season in your life. Your terrain and your struggles are going to vary on this journey to eternity. But that is worth the price. Worth it so that we can have eternity with God. All right, let's talk about the destination. We are traveling guests on earth. We're guests here. We're not residents, but visitors. We're not, we are strangers, non-citizens. We're immigrants, travelers. The Bible says sojourners, pilgrims, nomads. You remember when they were talking about they were going to their promised land, they had to travel through several places? That They were in the desert. The desert was not their destination. The desert was not their home. They were traveling from one place to a land of rest. 
Earth is not your destination. Earth is not where you're going to reside for eternity. There's another place for us. The citizens who occupy this land. You think of back when those children of Israel were coming out. The people didn't want them coming through. And, and here, while we're here on earth, there are so many people that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. They don't appreciate us. They, are, they look at us funny. They treat us unjustly. They treat us with uh, inhospitable. They, they mock us. They scoff at us. And in spite of all of this, many of us not only take the treatment from them, but we go out of our way to try to make them feel better about their time here on earth. We try to explain to them that, listen, I know what I'm doing. I know how I'm living makes you uncomfortable. Christ made the, the, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes. The, he made those folks uncomfortable. But Christ kept telling them truth. He says, verily, verily, this is the truth. What you're doing is not right. And that's what we do. We go and tell those people. We understand, we understand that light, light can't fellowship with darkness. So yes, we're going to make some people uncomfortable. If you're living holy, you're going to make some non-holy people uncomfortable by how you live your life when you give them truth. But we invite them to join us, become our welcome guests on our journey. We try to get them to see that the place where they reside, spiritually, mentally, socially, relationally, the place where they reside has flaws. It has defects. You wonder why your relationship isn't working. You wonder why your mental psyche is disturbed. You wonder why socially you don't feel like you fit in because we're working in a flawed system. This system that we live in now is flawed. We've seen it. God has put eternity in our hearts. We know that it's better. And we try to invite others. Look, life can be better than what it is that you're experiencing. I'm telling you, I, I'm speaking from experience. There's more to it than what you're experiencing right now. You're up one day, you're down tomorrow. You're in today, you're out tomorrow. It doesn't have to be that way. So why do we do this? Because we don't want them stuck in that rundown hotel. The scripture says the, in Proverbs, I'm going to read a few scriptures for you. Proverbs 11 and 30, and all of these are for the New King James. It says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. In Revelations 21, 1 through 4, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. That flawed system came to an end. He said, there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. God is going to dwell with us, people of God. He says, they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. For the old order of things has passed away. I'm telling you, that's what we receive in eternity. Got another one for you. This is from Matthew chapter 28, 18 and 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. This is why we're going. Even when those people don't want us around, Christ has commanded us to go. In 1 Corinthians, behold, uh, chapter 15, 51 through 54. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We should not all sleep, but we should all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, 
and this mortal, this housing, this tent must put on immortality. So when the corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 to 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. And last one, Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. For our citizenship is in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> your passport, your passport says that heaven is your place of origination from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. From a lowly body that it may be conformed to his glory according to the working by which he is able to even subdue all things to himself. Earlier I mentioned the temporary housing conditions that some of us are experiencing. Like I said, for some it's like that $19 a night place. For others, it seems like that five-star resort. Well, in eternity, we will once again be giving housing accommodations. The difference, however, is that the place where we end up at the moment we are reintroduced to eternity will now become our permanent dwelling place. For some, they will be introduced to a pest-infested, worm-ridden, no amenity, a place of eternal torment. Night and day, they will dwell there with no checkout time. For others, we will check into a resort better than anything we could have ever imagined. Our upgrade will be better than a presidential suite. We will reside in the presence of the Lord God Almighty, in the presence of his son, Jesus Christ. And there's no checkout required there as well. The determining factor to which key we will hold has everything to do with the decisions that we make now. Once we enter eternity, there's no turning around. There's no coming back. We heard earlier that every person is going to be judged by the things that they do. Well, I have good news for you. I have some good news and I have some bad news. The bad news is you can't do enough to earn eternity with God. There's not enough that you can do. The good news is that you don't have to do it. Christ has already done it for us. He has paid the price. Look, you can go and check in. And when you get to the, the, the check-in counter, you're going to hear, come on in, the price has already been paid. And there's no checkout time. Some people are thinking, Pastor Rollins, that sounds good. I think I want that place. I think I want to go to that upgraded suite where God and Jesus are there. Well, let me tell you how to do it. All you do is pray a simple prayer and pray it with sincerity and believe it. So if you're interested in, in journeying into eternity and making eternity a place where we reside with the Lord, say with me, say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. Your word tells me that if I confess with my mouth that I'm a sinner, and ask for your forgiveness that you will forgive me. Your word tells me that if I confess with my mouth that you are Lord and believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead, that you would save me. I do that right now. I make the confession that you are not only Lord, but you are my Lord. Come into my heart and dwell inside of me for eternity. And fill me with Holy Spirit, which serves as a guarantee that I belong to you. If you prayed that prayer and you prayed it with sincerity, I believe that you have a ticket. You have a key to eternity. Amen. 
And if you made that prayer, then we want to hear from you. I ask that you would send us an email. You can email us at jplifecc at cox.net and say, Pastor, I, uh, I, I heard and I want eternity with God. I don't want to go to that dwelling place where the worms and the, and the infestation is. You can let us know through email because we want to send you some information. We want you to be victorious in this walk. I've already told you, it's not. I can't tell you that it's easy, but it sure is worth it. Or you can write us. You can write us and send a note to us so that we can send some information back to you. Jesus People Life Changing Church, 800 Northwest 39th Avenue, Gainesville, Florida, 32609. And again, we want to send you some information to help you on this walk. Just want to remind you all that uh, Pastor Mingo is doing well. We spoke with him on this afternoon. He is looking good. He's sounding good. And we have every expectation that he will be before us very shortly. To remind you to tune in on a Sunday, Prophetess Mingo will be coming. And she will be sharing with us some more about how to function when the storms of life come. She's already told us about the earthquake. She's told us about the She's told us about the hurricane. Now, she's mentioned briefly, so we'll be hearing some good information. So we want to invite you to tune in and to share. Share these broadcasts so that others, others will be able to get some of the great teaching that we receive here at Jesus People Life Changing Church. Thank you again for watching. Thank you for tuning in. We pray God has given you something that makes sense to you and that you can adopt it and apply it to your life. And we close with these words. Remember, Christ can change your life. But only you can change your destiny. God bless you.